to see if there was anything strange in it. And he saw what he described to my friend Johnson as humanoid figures taller than the average earthly humanoid, something like seven foot plus, wearing um, a sort of phosphorescent, glowing orange. He described them as overalls, but it was just kind of a one-piece kit, and it was glowing slightly. And there were three or four of them in the field, and behind them was some sort of disc ship. He couldn't see it in much detail. It was too far away. And these things were coming towards him and his van. He leapt out and hid himself in one of the many ditches which are characteristic of East Anglian farms. And they very often get brambles growing across them. He crawled under the brambles and hid, absolutely petrified with fear. And he watched through the leaves and saw these things surrounding his van walking around it, apparently looking for him. Failing to find him, they walked back in the direction that they'd come from to the ship, if that's what it was, he thought it was, and then it vanished. He got back into his van, and it started at the first touch of the starter motor. He drove home in a state of abject terror. Now, not to say that they were hostile. They may only have wanted to have a quick look at him. Right. But, but they certainly frightened the life out of him. And my friend Johnson said that he was absolutely convinced that the boy was telling the truth. Well, a young man in his 20s, and that he was telling him the simple truth. So uh, I think if we took that story as just one example of a near encounter, and there's no doubt that... Uh, all, if we take all of the UFO stories together and just analyze them statistically, that there have been, both in the past and uh, now in the uh, present, there's a, another amazing example, which is a manuscript that can be checked up on. It's in the Coleman Library, which is an academic library, and... Uh, the uh, internet would find it without any bother, would find the Coleman Library and this document. And it sets out to describe, in the time of Oliver Cromwell, so we're in the 17th century, that a group of villagers at Comberton, which is uh, down in Cambridgeshire, saw, and in the language of the time, it's amazing, they saw what they described as a church spire or steeple taking off into the air, and they then described the noise it made. They said, and we've got to remember when they were around and what they would compare it with as part of their everyday lives, right. it made a noise as of a regiment of drummers. Now, if that, with perfect notes and stops, now that was it exactly, I remembered that verbatim because I was so fascinated by it. And it sounds for all the world like something that's giving a series of, you know, when a rocket comes down and fires a retro burst and then fires another one and then lands safely. And they also described that they saw two figures attached to it by what they called lines or ropes, who were grappling in the air. Now, it sounds to me as if two of the spacemen from this thing, or the aliens from it, were trying to repair something that hadn't gone right, and that uh, these guys from Combatant describing it. Anyhow, it was all carefully written down, and uh, is still preserved in the Coleman Library. So that's taking us back to the 17th century. And, and then when we look back at so many of the other ancient religions, we get accounts of people whom our ancestors referred to as gods flying in things they called vimanas or flying yeah. chariots. So right. I think we have been visited 
on many occasions, and we possibly have visitors with us in our 21st century. You know, I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> really, I wouldn't doubt it at all. Right. Well, you provided us with such brilliant information. We really appreciate you uh, being on the show. Can you share with us any current projects you're working on, as well as where the listeners can find some of your work? Yes, of course. I'm, uh, I was very, very pleased indeed recently. This is just one of my literary projects, which I, I can't resist telling you about. Um, having, having been a writer since 1952, when I sold my first story, um, I find it a very interesting and entertaining thing to do. Anyway, there was a short story competition in the Mensa magazine, and I entered one. And to my great delight, in the May edition of the magazine, they have listed the ten finalists in this huge competition. And I'm one of the ten finalists. We shan't know until June who's won, because they're going to invite votes on the stories. But that was... Uh, I, I was so pleased. When you think of the the strength of the competition for that magazine and uh, you know mm -hmm. the should we say the the intellectual power of the competitors mm -hmm. i thought wow at 80 next birthday i'm still in there fighting that can't be fair <laughs> awesome. and uh, other other the uh, other projects in terms of the the, the research that uh, uh, patricia and i are working on at the moment um we are um particularly interested uh, in this uh, time theme and the idea that there may be some way of looking at what appear to have been ghost stories or accounts of the psychic which could be accounted for so we're going through a vast archive of the um, places we've investigated to see what proportion of them might be better explained as a time slip. Or if you and I think from our experience of honest accounts of the paranormal and forthright accounts, the number of scenes that get reenacted. Now, it sounds as if, one of the explanations anyway, is that there has been some kind of glitch in time which recurs under certain conditions right. and enables us to see not ghosts or phantoms or spooks, but a real scene from the real past which has just come to us, as it were, down some sort of time telescope that we've been able to glimpse. And then, of course, going back to the, the power of human thought, when we were talking about thought as a form of energy, there's the idea of that energy being able to make recordings, just as we do a DVD and record that sort of electromagnetically. Right. So it's possible, and especially when the, the so-called specters and phantoms go through an emotion, say if there's been a murder or if it's an historic battlefield, then when we see that again, what we're really looking at is a recording from the fabric, from the crystals in the stone, a natural recording of very much the same type that we utilize when we're making deliberate recordings. And when we have the right playing equipment, that is when our minds in a so-called haunted house are in the right framework. Somebody who is a medium can see an activity that was etched into the fabric of that building 100 years ago, 200 years ago. And what we're seeing is just a replay of an event. So that this is a, a, another area that we're very interested in. And uh, those two, so watch this space. These may crop up in a book at any time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome, awesome. Well, Lionel, thank you so much for being on You Are Creators, really. 
well, you're you're much kinder than I deserve, and uh, <laughs> I, uh, any time that uh, you need me, you just give me a call. You'll be very, very welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Okay, I'll say cheers for now, and we'll get together again before too long, I'm sure. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> this is Justin and Erica from You Are Creators, and we support your dreams.